Hello. We will now begin the AFOCO Corporate Forum on Forest Climate and ESG hosted by AFOCO, or Asian Forest Co Cooperation Organization. I am Yoon Hee Jung, your MC today. Today's event will is prepared to share um, our outlook on ESG management and fighting climate change and to share trends and prospects of the forest carbon market. Despite the challenges of the COVID pandemic, we have on-site participants and online viewers of this event, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Let us begin by introducing our honored guests. Please welcome each guest with a big round of applause. Mr. Ricardo Calderon, Executive Director of AFOCO, is with us. Please welcome Mr. Calderon with a big hand. We have Mr. Mungu Kyun, President of New Paradigm Institute. Mr. Chong Inbo, CEO of SK Forest. Mr. Oh Dok Yo, Research Fellow of the Korea Corporate Governance Service, or KCGS. Mr. Lee Ok Soo, Director of Deloitte Anjin. The 31st Minister of Korea Forest Service and current Professor of Konguk University, Mr. Kim Jae Hyun. Mr. Park Geun Sik, Director General of the International Affairs Bureau of the KFS. Also joining us on Zoom, we have two speakers from Geneva and Paris. Ms. Margaret Kim, CEO of Gold Standard, and Mr. Jean Charles uh, Gringshard, Associate Partner of Dahlberg. Please welcome our two speakers with a big hand. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for being here. In line with COVID measures, we have invited the minimum number of guests on site and conducted thorough disinfection for safety. But to host as much participants as possible, this event is live streamed on Zoom as well. All presentations will be provided with simultaneous interpretation into Korean and English. On site participants, please use channel 1 for Korean and channel 2 for English on your receivers. Zoom participants, please click on the globe button at the bottom of your screen and choose the language you prefer. First of all, I'd like to invite our host, Executive Director Ricardo Calderon of AFOCO, for opening remarks. Please give a welcoming hand. Distinguished guests from the private sector, the diplomatic community, resource persons, and panelists physically present and attending online for this very important event, the AFOCO Corporate Forum on Forests, Climate, Environmental, Social, and Governance. A very pleasant day to every one of us. The forests of Asia covers 549 million hectares, equivalent to 14% of the global forest cover that plays a vital role in sustaining economic development that billions of people and thousands of industries that either directly or indirectly depend upon. These forest resources highly contribute to providing ecosystem services, biodiversity conservation, and strategic carbon balance against climate change to sustain industrial development and economic growth. But governments and economies 
as well as international and regional organizations like us, the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization, cannot do it alone by ourselves. APOCO recognizes the need for creating synergy with the private sector to jointly work with us by providing resources to protect and conserve forests of resources of Asia, including tropical forests, dryland, glacial and high altitude forests, peatlands, and mangroves in order to achieve the strategic carbon balance and sustainable industrial development and investments. Along this line, the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization, or AFOCO, organized through the serious efforts of the Republic of Korea from way back 2011, in collaboration with the ASEAN member states, now with 13 parties, namely Bhutan, Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Lao PDR, Mongolia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, Timor-Leste, Vietnam, and the Republic of Korea, observer countries, Singapore, Malaysia, and Kyrgyzstan, represented by the senior officials of forestry in the assembly, support balanced economic development and welfare enhancement in the developing countries and economies by building a healthy and sustainable forest resources base, functional forestry institutions, and governance mechanism to support economic growth while providing social and environmental safety nets against climate change. We are gathered here today, face to face and virtually, despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, to establish our strong and lasting partnership and the call to work with us, the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization. Mabuhay kamsaham nida. Thank you very much for your kind words through cooperation on forests in order to take action against climate change here in Asia. We are here today and thank you for the great words. And once again, another round of applause, please. Um, next, we have President and Chair of the Global Green Glo Growth Initiative and who served as the eighth Secretary General of the UN. We have Mr. Pan Ki moon who has sent us a congratulatory speech in video. Here it is. Mr. Ricardo Calderon, Executive Director of the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization, AFOCO. Excellencies, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 안녕하십니까? Thank you for the kind invitation to briefly address all of you and to launch the AFOCO Corporate Forum on Forest Climate and ESG. First, allow me to convey my warm appreciation to AFOCO and all the organizers for organizing this important event. As you all probably know, the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are two of the most often associated achievements of my tenure as a Secretary General of the United Nations. Therefore, I am always very pleased to support events such as this forum, which aim to fight the climate crisis and contribute to the goals of the 2030 Agenda. In addition, after having experienced a nearly 50-year career as a diplomat and public servant, I am well aware of the limitations of what governments can do alone and the critical potential role of the private sector. As I have emphasized many times, to tackle the climate crisis and achieve sustainable development, we have to work together across political parties, national boundaries, economic sectors, and business industries. 
Consider the fact that the vast majority of modern in inventions and technological advances have always been ushered in by the private sector, not government research grants. Combine that with the fact that today, consumers and investors alike are increasingly demanding that companies have a collective consciousness, the environmental, social, and corporate governance, ESG factors that are non-financial by nature as a tool to identify risks and opportunities. And the crucial importance of the private sector is not surprising. Furthermore, when companies team up together with the governments to combine technological advances with the nature-based solutions to fight the climate crisis, the resulting impact is certain to be much greater than the sum of the individual parts. Therefore, I fully welcome the approach of organizations such as the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI, and AFOCO to develop nature-based solutions for their mitigation and adaptation activities in partnership with the private sector stakeholders. I also welcome the realignment of goals and commitments by companies to address climate change and to become more responsible. The companies that act sooner rather than later will gain a head start and build up know-how, capacity, and technological advantages. And in time, I hope our group will grow to include more companies to help more countries achieve their commitments to the Paris Climate Change Agreement and attain the Sustainable Development Goals. Once again, I would like to thank AFOCO for organizing this event, and I extend my best wishes for very productive sessions and discussions. Thank you. Kamsamida. Thank you very much. In this age of ESG management, we must take more responsibility for more active um, climate response. Before we move on to the main part of our forum, let us take a photo session with our honored guests that I have previously introduced. I'd like to invite all eight honored guests to come forward. That would be the Executive Director Kao Jeroen, President Boon Guk Hyun, uh, Mr. Chung In Bo, Mr. Yook Su, Mr. Kim Jae Hyun, and Mr. Park Eun Sik, please. Could you take one step forward? Please face forward. For the successful hosting of the AFOCO Corporate Forum, if you can face the camera and clap your hands. Thank you very much. Please return to your seats. Um, our focal response to the climate change in Asia and to facilitate the management of forests in Asia and to reinforce forests, uh, AFOCO has been established. And we have prepared a video introducing AFOCO and its main activities. Here it is. Although the rate of forest loss has slowed, and many international commitments and initiatives have been launched, estimates still show we lost 10 million hectares of forests every year.
Across Asia, a treaty-based intergovernmental organization aims to bolster forest cooperation to bring together expertise across countries and turn proven sustainable forest management technologies and policies into concrete action to confront the challenges of climate change. This is the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization. A FOCO began as a proposal by Korea in 2009 to strengthen regional cooperation in Asia's forest sector, and then formalized in 2011 by the ASEAN-Korea ROK Forest Cooperation Agreement. In 2018, the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization began its operation as an international organization. A FOCO has now been granted observer status by the United Nations General Assembly. To enhance the function of the organization, the headquarters agreement between the government of the Republic of Korea and a FOCO has been arranged and came into force this July 2021 and is now accredited as an international organization eligible for fundraising of designated donations by the Republic of Korea. As announced in April 2021, AFOCO has also been included in the OECD DAC list of ODA eligible international organizations from 2021 reporting. AFOCO strives to help member countries achieve the global goal of increasing forest cover by up to 3% worldwide, implement Paris Agreement commitments, especially in pursuing policy approaches for adaptation in the forestry sector and improve the livelihoods and the general income of communities through forestry-related activities. To achieve its goals, a FOCO is guided by strong core values, values that drive the push to deliver on a FOCO's commitment to its strategic priority areas. These are initiate customized restoration and reforestation models, target communities, natural habitats, and forest ecosystems receive the benefit of models applied in a balanced and integrated approach for forest landscape restoration, support research and development in climate change adaptation, scientific studies on forestry adaptation approaches are supported, and policy is adopted for vulnerable member countries that use relevant adaptation methods and approaches, introduce systematic management for forest-related disasters, Demonstration sites for control and management of forest-related disasters are established, and technology-based preventive and control measures are applied where appropriate, improve local livelihood, and develop community-based small enterprises. Best practices on payments for ecosystem services, ecotourism, and community-based enterprise development in target areas are identified and implemented, strengthen institutional capabilities, diversify resources, and promote regional action. To address diverse socio-economic settings among members and expand collaboration with other organizations. Member countries, together with a FOCO, promote action-oriented forest cooperation programs that address socio-environmental needs unique to each region, including promoting education to develop more forest experts through the Regional Education and Training Center in Myanmar. To address capacity development needs in the forest sector, a FOCO operated diverse capacity building programs. A FOCO's regular training courses have contributed more than 6,000 participant days annually. Also, young forest professionals from a FOCO's member countries participated in the capacity building programs such as a FOCO's scholarship program, fellowship program, and the science and technology exchange partnership program. The continued threat to our forests, especially in Asia, must be met. With a sustained push, a continuous effort to harness the expertise, the knowledge and the leadership of our member countries and rise to the challenge to bring us to a resurgent and greener Asia. That was an overview of AFOCO's purpose, history, and current projects. 
The topic of this forum is responding to climate change through forests and revitalizing ESG management and investment in the forests. We are now ready for the first presentation by Ms. Margaret Kim, CEO of Gold Standard. Gold Standard quantifies, maximizes, and certifies the impact of climate and sustainable development activities. Ms. Margaret Kim was head of strategy and integration and also head of GCF liaison at GGGI. She has much experience in international management roles, and here is Ms. Kim. You have the floor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Annyeonghaseyo. Um, thank you, Mr. Ricardo Calderon and Mr. Ban Ki-moon for inspiring remarks. It's a great pleasure to be part of this event from Geneva. And I would like to thank uh, AFOCO for bringing us together. So we're here to talk about how we can promote climate change response through forest sector and, and what role private sector can play. And before I get to my presentation to introduce a number of financial mechanisms and the role of private sector, I would like to reiterate Mr. Calderon's point about the importance of forestry in addressing climate change and sustainable development. Forests help to stabilize climate. It's reported that uh, stopping loss and degradation of natural systems and promoting their restoration have the potential to contribute to more than 30% of the total climate change mitigation that's required by 2030. But, but forests can provide much more. As, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Calderon, um, they regulate ecosystems, uh, protect biodiversity, and support livelihoods and really play an important role for many communities and countries to drive sustainable development. So in the recent years, um, I'm, I'm truly excited about the recent years where I saw an enormous shift of climate change and sustainability moving from periphery of an organization to center table of board of directors and executives discussions. This is no longer a topic for CSR or ESG teams of the uh, teams of the corporates, but really became a mainstream issue that is a core of many businesses around the world. So we saw from COP26 a number of pledges and an active leadership by corporates, uh, corporates and financial sector. However, these ambitious commitments and plans come with risk of greenwashing. So gold standard is all about managing, measuring, and maximizing impact in a credible and transparent way. We were founded by WWF and other NGOs in 2003. We're a Swiss-based NGO that was built to ensure quality and raising ambition in the markets, in the carbon markets. Uh, in the last 19 years, we've worked with more than 2,000 climate protection projects in more than 80 countries. And, and really learning from our experience in the carbon markets, Gold Standard is also applying its best practices as a standard and impact management body to help companies meet their um, climate and SDG targets within and beyond their value chains and also helping public and private investors to manage, measure, and maximize impact through innovative finance, uh, finance vehicles. So when we talk about impact monetization, uh, whether that's a carbon credit or monetized impact in uh, traded in the market, or uh, impact reporting by corporates, it's much more than just reporting outcomes or receiving carbon credits at the end of a project or a program. To both avoid risk and maximize positive impact, Gold Standard's role starts at the very beginning uh, uh, and is embedded through the process, from project design to robust MRV to strong governance and managing that claim. 
So upfront, our eligibility criteria, rigorous and uh, safeguards, and local stakeholder consultation requirements help to ensure that investments go where funds are genuinely needed and additional to avoid greenwashing um, for impact investment. And, and, and also for uh, uh, market projects. These also help to ensure well-intended portfolios, projects or programs don't have unintended negative consequences. And our impact quantification methodologies provide an accurate measurement of, of what has actually been accomplished. And finally, the impact verification process, which is very important, provides assurance that a project isn't claiming as it wishes, but the impact claims are backed up by quali uh, qualified independent third, par third party verifier. And we also have a governance structure that, that monitors this. And for carbon credit projects in uh, a carbon credit projects, we require minimum three SDG impacts to be verified throughout the project cycle. And for, um, for issues that rise through these projects, we also have a grievance mechanism that's public, transparent, and, and, and informative. And for forestry projects, we also have a permanent buffer uh, for, the, for the risk management. So looking at the, the voluntary carbon market portfolio at gold standard, afforestation and reforestation are about 5% of our credit issuance today for the markets. However, we're seeing a huge growing pipeline and prices are also increasing significantly for these AR credits, largely due to um, science-based targets initiative, deeming removal, carbon removals being eligible for net zero targets. And, and we're seeing general uh, uh, growth in nature-based solutions, uh, uh, high demand and also growth, both in the markets and, and non-market financial mechanisms. So for the carbon market mechanisms, if they're designed with proper incentives and safeguards, it can certainly help catalyze private investment to unleash trillions of dollars required to secure global net zero. The voluntary carbon market uh, rapidly accelerates uh, and, and last year it, it reached a size of 1 billion US dollars uh, as, and, and, and we are seeing a, a continuous growth of the market going forward. So it's not surprising that financial sector and corporates are also increasingly getting involved in, in this emerging market opportunity. In parallel, the broader world of sustainable finance is also presenting new opportunities to fund positive impact for climate and communities around the world with, with ESG rising on the agenda of many investors. I, I mentioned before that, um, that there are criteria for forest projects at gold standard and and at gold standard we don't certify red plus projects and this is not to criticize the red plus projects we don't see a fit for fit for purpose in in our approach so rather than and, and it's important to understand that carbon markets is not for every type of project so rather than trying to force fit, avoided deforestation or some of the nature-based solutions into carbon credit model, we at Gold Standard were focused on innovative ways to incentivize positive impact for nature, including forest conservation, regeneration, with a goal including but not limited to increasing carbon stocks. So we're looking at holistic uh, uh, approach across the SDGs to help ensure we address the drivers of deforestation and avoid optimizing for one single metric, for example, carbon, at the expense of others like biodiversity, water access, uh, water access and et cetera. So, so at Gold Standard, we're looking at uh, uh, different ways to innovate with private sector um, uh, beyond the, the carbon credit model which is 
working with ICL standards, we're looking at sustainable commodities to, to define common practices uh, to calculate carbon reduction and re, uh, sequestration that companies can easily report against their SBT, the science-based target, or other climate uh, performance objectives. This can help to drive sustainability at a landscape scale through certified commodities with improved climate impact. Another innovation we're, uh, we're working with partners is portfolio level certification. So there are a lot of emerging blended finance vehicles for nature-based solutions. So we're working with uh, US-based um, private equity and IUCN, which is a global uh, leading conservation organization um, uh, and, and green climate fund to, to create a blended private equity um, facility to fund um, subnational level infrastructure projects uh, with nature-based solutions focused. And, and our role at Gold Standard is to ensure that these projects are designed properly to maximize impact and, and at the end to certify the fund and project portfolio. And we're also looking at landscape and jurisdictional approaches because forestry sector is, is almost impossible just to look at it from from a project level or a single area level. It has to be looked at from a landscape and jurisdictional uh, uh, perspective. And finally, we're also looking at um, uh, working with corporates and impact investors to develop collective action funds. As corporates raise their ambition to, to reach net zero, we're seeing a huge challenge around addressing um, challenges around value chain, especially scope three, the supply chain. So can we create a collective action funds to, to collectively uh, invest in addressing those challenges um, and, and claim the impact and share the uh, impact claim amongst the investors? So that's another model that can be explored in the forestry sector in relation to the corporate value chain. I briefly mentioned about uh, focus on corporate value chain because we're realizing that uh, for most corporates, almost more than 80% of their value chain carbon footprint comes from scope three, the, the supply chain. So addressing the challenges around that is, is critical. So before getting to the, the innovative financial mechanisms or the carbon credits in the market, I think it's important for all corporates, small or big, to follow the, the following steps. First, they need to um, disclose, measure and disclose their carbon footprint and, and publicly uh, uh, share that information. And second, the corporates need to have a longer term plan to reach their climate ambition and sustainable development ambition. And, and of course, share that with the public. And third, they will try along with the, the strategy, they will try to reduce within their boundaries and finance beyond. And, and financing beyond can use a number of mechanisms that I presented today, including the carbon markets, including the, the blended finance mechanisms, including the collective action funds. And these can help to drive uh, greater ambition for a private sector, especially the corporates, to act on their value chain, make their uh, value chain net zero or net zero aligned or Paris aligned uh, to drive climate, uh, to drive addressing climate uh, uh, crisis. So just to conclude, I think it's important that that climate change or the forestry sector is not a two dimensional uh, uh, picture. It, it involves lots of co-benefits, lots of sustainable development impact potential for communities, the most vulnerable communities around the world. So one, it's important that the corporates have strategies and, and ways to claim their impact, claim their, uh, claim their impact for their investment, but also be mindful of the broader impact they're having for these most vulnerable communities around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
A big round of applause, please. If you have any questions, please um, leave them on the Zoom um, platform so that we can collect and deliver them to the speaker during the panel session. And next, we have Mr. John Charles Ginchard of Dahlberg. He currently is the associate partner at Dahlberg and leads its efforts in the environment and climate sector. He co-authored a WEF report, Investing in Forests, The Business Case, and advises international corporates and institutions, including the GCF, IKEA, the WWF, and more. The title is Investing in Forests, The Business Case. Hello. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, please. Okay, I'll assume that you can uh, hear me well. Uh, please let me know if there is any connection issue. Thank you, uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests and co-speakers. Good afternoon. Uh, before starting, I would like to extend my thanks to Afoco for organizing this very promising event. My name is Jean-Charles Guinchard. I'm an associate partner with Dalbeck Advisors. Uh, we are a mission-driven global consultancy, helping corporates, uh, investors, institutions, and other organizations with their environmental and development ambition. Um, we are a long-time partner, long partner uh, of the World Economic Forum. And for the last year, we've been uh, helping the 1T.org initiative, which stands for 1 Trillion Trees, 1 Trillion Trees.org initiative, gather and support multinational companies in their journey towards uh, what I will call a corporate forest leadership. It started with this report uh, called Investing in Forests, the business case, um, and that I will quickly summarize in the next few minutes. And it continues now with uh, 1T.org pledges and regional initiatives, and with more and more companies launching or revising their corporate, for, their corporate forest leadership uh, strategy. I uh, will uh, cover in the next few minutes three main questions summarizing the report. Um, the first one being, how can businesses create value by investing in forest conservation and restoration across sectors? And this is probably an important distinction that we are making in this report. What are industry leaders already doing uh, to see this opportunity? And how can all businesses progress towards a corporate forest leadership? We were, uh, of course, starting this report uh, by recapping the uh, dual climate change and nature loss crisis that we're facing, and more specifically, the interdependencies between businesses, corporations, and this uh, dual crisis. Of course, uh, by the lens of the interdependencies between nature and ecosystem services and business operations, the um, vulnerability of businesses to the physical effects of climate change, but also the, uh, increasingly, the increasing pressure from governments, consumers, investors, on businesses to transition towards net zero emissions. But I will not uh, cover this, uh, these aspects for, for much longer today. I know that you are all familiar with uh, this topic. Just for um, terminology purpose, we wanted to be very clear in this report that what we call forest conservation and restoration is not something that comes uh, instead of halting deforestation. Halting deforestation any uh, business practices that contributes to nature loss or climate change uh, must be uh, addressed as a, as a prerequisite. What we call forest conservation and restorations comes on top of it, investing in these ecosystems to mitigate the effects uh, of climate change and protect and restore uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. The main message that we want, wanted to convey with uh, this report is summarized in this uh, graphic that, that you can see now. The idea, the main idea of this report is that businesses have interest in investing in forest conservation and restoration. Across sectors, for different reasons, they can create business value in three ways. Starting uh, for once on the right hand side of this page, you can see that the first branch of opportunity that we've drawn here is called values-based leadership. This is probably the most instinctive uh, aspect of benefits of investing in forest um, conservation and restoration. This is about increasing customer trust, you know, ensuring alignment uh, between your corporate values and uh, your customer base, 
building this trust. This is also about improving talent attraction and retention, especially uh, for the younger generation of employees, and improving relationships uh, with your business and ecosystem partners. But beyond this first aspect, we have highlighted two other uh, branch of opportunities. On the left, this is about business profitability and growth. And here, we're talking about two levels of opportunities. Of course, when you invest in a project of forest conservation and, or restoration, this is about investing, not granting, not donating. So you can have direct project outputs uh, from this uh, project. But there is another layer, which is uh, more at the corporate level, at the portfolio level, where you can have increasing, where you can have an opportunity to increase your growth or increase your profit profitability through reduced cost or increased um, uh, prices um, in your in your product portfolio. I will come back to this. And on the top of this tree, this is probably the, the uh, largest field of, of opportunities uh, for businesses. It's about building up your business resilience. You can, uh, depending on your sector and the situation of your uh, company, you can reduce your supply risk, uh, protecting your value chains from the physical effects of the nature crisis, you can reduce your demand risk um, by making sure your customer demand will be maintained and will not be um, altered by um, external, uh, external events like uh, sanitary crisis. There is also the regulatory risk by investing in forest conservation and restoration ahead, you maintain uh, your position uh, uh, staying ahead of regulatory requirements. And finally, uh, we wanted to stress the importance of reducing capital risk with uh, increasing pressure from investors uh, for companies to adopt more and more uh, demanding standards. That's a way to maintain your access to capital. Um, of course, not all companies, not all businesses will uh, do the same thing in forest conservation and restoration, or will do it for the same reasons. We differentiate three main categories of businesses, um, of sectors. The first one is uh, sectors with high dependence, where companies have a high level of dependency on forests. You can think of forestry, of course, but also consumer goods, food, agriculture, tourism, businesses that source their products directly from trees and forests, and businesses that are reliant on forest ecosystem services or forest risk, forest risk commodities. For this type of companies, this is about building resilience, most importantly, to supply risk, to demand risk, but also it's about increasing business profitability and growth through differentiated uh, product offering. And it can also improve relationships with uh, business partners. The second category of uh, sector and business is uh, sectors with a lower dependency on forest and not necessarily high uh, greenhouse gas emissions because of their operations. Here I'm talking about financial services, technology, consulting, business services, insurance. Here the question is about how to build resilience to demand risk through investing in forest as part of a portfolio-wide net zero strategy. It's about increasing business profitability and growth as well, and uh, of course, increasing values-based leadership, as I mentioned before. And finally, the third type of, of business here is businesses with high greenhouse gas emissions due to the very nature of their uh, focus. I'm talking about energy, transport, mining, construction, manufacturing. And here, the point is really about uh, building resilience to regulatory risk, capital risk, demand risk, and also increasing business profitability and growth. I'll, I'll come back to this in more details. Very quickly, and without getting into uh, the details of all examples here, this is a global map uh, that is far from being exhaustive, but from uh, global leaders that uh, all of us know that are already acting on forest conservation and restoration. It can be about RGE protecting 150,000 hectares of piece of peat swamp in Indonesia. It can be about HP restoring 80,000 hectares of uh, forest in China and Brazil, etc., etc. I will not go into the details, but you can recognize a, a few familiar logos from, from Amazon to Apple, uh, Salesforce to MasterCard, Rabobank, any, etc., etc. Going to a little bit more detail, uh, we see 
three ways for businesses to invest in forest conservation and restoration. The first one is investing within existing business operations and supply chains. This is about, of course, continuing to avoid deforestation, uh, but going further and securing new economic opportunities by uh, analyzing um, uh, supply chains and business operations to identify greatest of opportunity to create shared value. You can see a few uh, logos on the right here from Nestlé to L'Oréal to Danone to McDonald's, etc. Taking just one uh, example quickly, we can talk about Nestlé. Uh, to mitigate potential supply and demand risk, Nestlé is evolving from an avoided deforestation strategy to a more proactive approach that incorporates forest restoration and conservation within and across its uh, value chain. So it's focusing on uh, efforts within its own value chain, as opposed to an offsetting approach, uh, we can call this insetting approach. Uh, so working with supply chain partners to grow trees on their farms or in the nearby landscapes through agroforestry initiatives, forest restoration projects. Um, for example, Nestle will distribute 2.8 million uh, shade trees by 2022 in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana and train its own farmers in how to implement agroforestry uh, practices. The second pathway here is about using existing skills and or assets from your company, even if it's not directly related to the forest ecosystems. Um, this is about leveraging your product suite, your influence, your um, financial assets, your partnerships, your customer base and your employees. Here you can see a lot of financial service companies, banks, uh, technology companies. Uh, taking just one example, uh, Salesforce, the cloud computing service uh, as a software uh, company. Well, Salesforce has uh, revealed uh, a few years ago now an ambition to grow 100 million trees. And to support this objective, Salesforce is using its existing skills, influence and employee base uh, to support forest conservation and restoration while also funding uh, restoration projects on the side. But on the first aspect, they are using a few different things. They are using the technology assets. Uh, they um, made their technology available to develop Uplink, uh, which is a new global digital platform to crowdsource innovations that accelerate the delivery of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. They have leveraged their employee base uh, to support forest conservation through matching donations to double the impact of an, any employee donation to tree organizations and organizing business-wide volunteering events uh, focused on tree and project, forest projects in, in global communities. They're also using their global influence and network uh, to support forest-focused partnerships and policies um, in the context of uh, 1T.org, for example, and they're directly funding forest conservation and restoration projects. The third uh, pathway here is about investing outside uh, of your own supply chain to achieve strategic objectives. When uh, you don't have a direct link to uh, forest ecosystems in your own value chain, but you are an emitter of uh, greenhouse gas uh, because, your, uh, because of your sector specificity, you can still be very active. And you can see here a lot of energy companies uh, and a few others. Uh, taking one example, for example, uh, Shell. Uh, Shell has made um, a commitment to, to reach net zero emissions by 2050 uh, on scope one and two emissions, but also on scope three emissions. So within their broader net zero strategy, Shell plans to invest uh, around $100 million a year in nature-based solutions to mitigate their own residual emissions but also to make this a business opportunity. They've launched a nature-based solutions um, uh, business that is incorporating high quality carbon credits within the energy solutions they are uh, selling to, to, their, to their clients. So they're both active on addressing their own emissions and making this a, a profitable business opportunity. To summarize what we've, what we've been able to observe uh, within this movement of, of large co corporates and leaders in their field towards what we call corporate forest leadership. And we has, we've, we've observed five main steps. The first uh, step for most, company, uh, for most companies was to become aware and engage. It's about understanding the business case uh, for investing in forests as we're doing today. 
set and setting a vision for their forest investments. This is, uh, as mentioned before, um, an important milestone and to do it uh, with a well-recognized high standard approach uh, like uh, science-based targets. The second step is about developing uh, the corporate strategy and integrating this strategy within your own business strategy and within your own uh, sustainability strategy. Prioritizing the focus areas uh, that you want to be involved in and then moving to planning and collaboration, making sure that your detailed uh, plan on forest conservation is, uh, is ready to implement. And then once you're in the implementation stage, making sure that you're doing it with the right partners, reporting it with the highest standard to track your impact. And then uh, the final step is, of course, taking a broader role within this large movement in shaping and educating uh, other uh, businesses so that they join uh, this movement. A few important principles here. Uh, I will not go into the details here, but we've been uh, engaging with, with dozens of corporates and a certain number of, of principles have surfaced that's very important regardless of the sector. The first one is about protecting uh, protecting existing forests and enabling natural forest regrowth before anything else. And the other ones uh, are partner prevent, prioritize and, and, and plan. The platform I was referring to uh, earlier, 1t.org, is now uh, active. Uh, it drives changes uh, by mobilizing private sector ambition and engagement, uh, advocating for credible commitments uh, of, from companies yeah, like yours through pledges, accelerating restoration in priority regions uh, in the US, in the Sahel, in the Amazon Basin, in India and in China, uh, and emp empowering a new generation of ecopreneurs. Uh, I mentioned the Uplink platform earlier. This is part of their uh, activity. One important aspect of uh, the 1T.org um, action is around corporate pledges. This is an opportunity for uh, multinational or regional companies to showcase their pledge to conserve, restore, and grow trees, um, feature their, this, this commitment on the pledge page of the 1T.org website on the World Economic Forum World website and celebrate with a uh, branded social media assets and 1T.org press release their, their commitments. This is only possible, of course, with a set of uh, demanding requirements, uh, such as a 1.5 degree science-based target or a credible net zero goal by or before 2050. Um, now, this uh, alliance is, is active globally and through uh, regional, sorry, um, and through regional hubs uh, to make sure that uh, practical initiatives are, are launched, kicked off and scaled up. We can mention the Climate Smart Forest Economy Program uh, and other initiatives in the Amazon Basin uh, or, or in the Sahel region. Finally, to wrap up on what uh, companies like yours could uh, benefit from this kind of engagement, beyond the actions of um, the platform in itself or alliances with many uh, companies from different sectors and different geographies. Uh, we uh, are, uh, independently from the 1T.org efforts, more as uh, Dalberg as, as advisors, working with, with companies uh, across this corporate journey to leadership. And we've been able to uh, isolate a few uh, learning questions uh, throughout these different steps I, I mentioned. This is, of course, a moving uh, a moving picture where um, we we are uh, enriching our learnings when we're working with different uh, corporates to uh, document what can be a, a useful guide for corporations like yours uh, when they want to uh, get started or uh, getting or get better uh, in their journey towards uh, forest corporate leadership. I will not go into the details of this slide. I know we are on a tight schedule, but I will be happy to answer any question later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we were able to see different business cases of um, forest leadership from Jean Charles from Dahlberg. Next uh, presentation is from Ecosystem Marketplace. Uh, we have uh, Director Stefan Dono Perio from Ecosystem Marketplace. He is going to talk to us about uh, trend and outlook in forest carbon market. 
Ecosystem Marketplace uh, is a non-profit initiative of uh, Forest Trends. It uh, collects carbon market data and also global ecosystem service data. Mr. Donoprio has more insight uh, into the carbon market than anyone else, but unfortunately today he has sent us a pre-recorded video. So please uh, enjoy the video. Hello, and uh, thank you very much to the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization uh, for having me here uh, today uh, to provide this presentation. Uh, it's an honor uh, and, a, and a privilege to, to speak with you today uh, and your 16 member countries uh, that are based in Asia. Uh, my name is Steven D'Onofrio. I'm the Program Director of Ecosystem Marketplace, which is a nonprofit initiative of Forest Trends based out of Washington, D.C. Uh, I am currently based in New York City, um, and, uh, and I'm really grateful that you're providing me this opportunity to uh, prepare this presentation in advance, uh, record uh, this uh, so that you can hear it uh, during your daytime, which would be in my uh, very late hours of night, and uh, and as I have a, a newborn uh, baby at, at about four weeks old, uh, this flexibility to present uh, on a pre-recorded line is very much appreciated. Um, that being said, my email address is on the screen. In case you do have any questions for us, uh, uh, we're happy to answer your questions. Uh, very sorry I can't be there in person again um, and, and also uh, in real time. Uh, so let me proceed with this presentation uh, without much ado. So before I begin uh, talking about forest carbon markets, uh, and I, I think it's important to provide a little bit of context. Um, the, the first bit of context here is to break down the different types of uh, payments and markets and finance uh, for forests. Uh, the primary market and, and finance mechanism that I'll talk about today is the voluntary voluntary forest carbon market. Uh, ecosystem Marketplace, we track uh, global carbon markets for all project types uh, across the globe. We have uh, a number of different uh, organizations uh, based uh, in different countries, around 40 different headquarter locations, uh, reporting projects uh, that are originating from over 80 different countries across all project categories. Um, but today I'll talk about our voluntary forest carbon um, uh, market information. Uh, essentially what makes markets like this voluntary um, is that there's no regulatory compliance obligating uh, or compelling purchasing uh, you know, for these credits in order to meet some sort of climate reduction goal. Uh, compliance markets are those with legal frameworks. Um, very often, uh, they are uh, national markets. They might be, you know, other other markets that are focused on certain sectors, such as um, uh, in the International Civil Aviation Organization has their carbon offsetting program, Corsia. These are tracking when we track compliance mechanisms. We're tracking policy developments as well as the credit prices, uh, and so we do have a partnership with ICAO to provide a, a Corsia eligible carbon price index, which is uh, posted for the first time uh, in November of last year, and we'll be updating this uh, price report very soon. And then there are also um, Red Plus funding mechanisms and activities. So Red Plus stands for reduced emissions from deforestation degradation, uh, plus uh, other other benefits. Um, and and the frameworks that have emerged from this uh, have essentially provided two different. Um, main phases uh, such as readiness allowing for capacity building and development of national strategies uh, as well as implementation uh, of those strategies and ongoing capacity building and technology plans for transfer um, but there's also results-based payments uh, which is paying for verified emissions um, However, even when countries advance to this third stage uh, of results-based payments, the payments for emission reductions in these countries are not historically in a market context. Uh, so that's why those transactions don't appear in the carbon offsets report. Um, and I will, uh, I'll just proceed here to the next slide to talk a little bit more about context uh, and scene setting. Um, so we, we feel, you know, there's been a long road uh, preceding us uh, to getting us to this point where we have a very vibrant and uh, an excited carbon market, particularly focused on nature-based uh, carbon, carbon credit projects. 
uh, dating back to the early 90s uh, and then the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, uh, which recognized a very limited scope of forestry and, and land-based projects, uh, particularly only afforestation, reforestation. And there's been several sequential moments, uh, such as the mid-2000s, where we had uh, progress around jurisdictional red plus and nesting policy development, um, leading into the mid-2010s, uh, where there was development of criteria uh, for developing countries to qualify for results-based finance uh, via the Warsaw Framework for red plus. Um, in this time period also, the Paris Agreement was drafted with Article 6, uh, which was later uh, agreed to in, in COP26 uh, in, um, in 2021. Uh, and also in Glasgow uh, during COP26, uh, there was the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use, where countries uh, committed to working together to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, deliver sustainable development, and promote an inclusive rural transformation. Now, Alongside that, there's also been progress on scientific uh, research and initiatives. And just to highlight a couple of pieces here uh, in the late 2010s, uh, um, research showing that nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions offer about a third of the climate solution to get to the two degrees Celsius Paris Agreement uh, you know, uh, a target. Uh, that was followed up by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Forest uh, or Climate and Lands. Um, and so increasingly, we've seen this research come together to show uh, the benefits that we can achieve by protecting and uh, restoring and conserving uh, forests and lands uh, in order to meet climate objectives. Um, now, shifting into how the private sector is responding to that. And I understand that we all might be aware of some of these developments, but it, but I think it's very, very important that over the past three decades, finally now, uh, sustainability with a real focus on climate change um, is at the top of business agendas worldwide, from the board of directors down to the, uh, the entry level staff. Um, whether it's bottom up or top down, there is, uh, you know, excitement and interest in, in dealing with climate, not just from a risk perspective, but also from an opportunities perspective. So this has led to about you know over 5,200 businesses uh, and, a, and a number of large investors that are bonding together to create uh, net zero carbon neutrality, other types of commitments. Um, and if you go to the Race to Zero website, uh, that's that's held by the UN uh, climate change team, uh, you can see these companies listed there. But it's really this composite of of different initiatives that are bringing together companies with um, with commitments around climate. Uh, that is what is driving this this market. Vault um, markets depend on both supply and demand. The supply is very clearly, you know, evidenced, and the scientific research is supporting that. Now, the demand side is awake to this this opportunity of uh, near term benefits from uh, the use of carbon credits to achieve uh, climate goals. Uh, Long-term 2030, 2040, 2050 climate commitments around net zero or carbon neutrality, carbon positive, whatever the terminology is or, or the approach might be for a particular company in a particular sector, um, it, is, it is so clearly uh, you know, offering this opportunity to uh, incentivize further project development, uh, whether it's forests or it's uh, renewable energy or other types of projects. Um, and, and the market that we, uh, as we tracked it last year for voluntary carbon markets, uh, has um, it just by you know close to the third quarter of last year, we found that the uh, the market had achieved uh, just over a billion dollars in market notional value. Very very important because uh, the leading you know uh, initiatives such as the task force and scaling voluntary carbon markets final report. Their very high scenario uh, stated that uh, stated that by 2030 we might see a 100 billion dollar market value. Um, <clears throat> also, I think to, to highlight here is uh, the importance of these initiatives that are building up the infrastructure outside of the standards and other components um, to ensure that there are uh, principles and guidelines for integrity of supply as well as integrity of demand side approaches. Uh, that's the Integrity Council on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets, as well as uh, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative. There's much more going on um, uh, behind the scenes and, and to enable this, um, but those are just a few examples. Uh, now to shift into the work that we do, uh, Ecosystem Marketplace, we have um, uh, hundreds of uh, respondents uh, to our 
uh, ask for trade data, um, which we had historically done annually. We've now made this a on-demand uh, reporting system. The information we gather is proprietary, confidential trade data about the carbon credit sales. Um, we are the largest system that, uh, that of, of data that allows us to then build uh, global perspectives as well as very detailed um, um, you know, perspectives about market activity. Um, we ask for information about not just the, the prices, but the, the details about the projects, the trade details, the contract structure, the counterparty information. Uh, and that allows us to provide a lot of the insights that I'm, I'm going to share with you today. So I mentioned uh, that the market had reached a, a billion dollar uh, value. I'll get to that in just a second. But this is a historical timeline that shows um, that the, the size of the market each year uh, dating back to, to pre-2005. Um, the volume of traded val uh, offsets has hit. Uh, hit a record volume in uh, 2020, uh, near record volumes, you know, I should say, because back in the, um, the mid, mid 2000s, there was a pre-compliance surge uh, as, as the United States uh, was looking like it might have a federal carbon program. Uh, and so you can see that evidence there. Uh, but this growth is really representing, you know, a significant percentage increase uh, in previous years. Uh, and, and the market in 2021, uh, which we are in the process of chewing up right now, uh, is only showing to be uh, even higher. Uh, so as we, uh, as we approached the COP26, uh, we developed a special bulletin uh, to provide an update with new trade since the report that uh, we published in September. Um, and that showed the market had now achieved that a billion plus milestone. Um, we're now in the process of chewing up that data. Respondents are reporting uh, uh, trades from Q4 and other respondents are providing full calendar year data. So we'll be providing an update at the end of March uh, you know, with this, uh, with this new, new information about the size of the 2021 market. Just to say though, that forestry and land use credits uh, dominated uh, the, the, uh, the majority of the newly uh, reported volumes, uh, about 61% uh, of what that was reported to us um, as we prepared this bulletin for COP. Uh, so it's really showing, you know, that the that forestry is at top of, uh, top of minds for buyers. Um, I now want to just take a couple of moments to, to share, you know, some some of the, some of the details behind these different project categories, but um, but but really to hone in on the forestry and land use. This is just looking at the past few years. Um, now, surprisingly, you might see that prices are kind of relatively staying the same. Again, you know, this is global data, so when you're dealing with uh, you know, dozens, if not, you know, close to 80 different countries where projects are originating from, uh, as well as uh, market volumes uh, that are at the size of around 115, you know, million tons, um, that the, the volume weighted average price for that, uh, you know, may not be as indicative as looking at a specific slice. Um, but, but this just gives you a sense of how prices and volumes are, are evolving over the past few years. Um, and and the, the real kind of uh, information here is about uh, that, that it's, it's the value of this market that is increasing. So, you know, while prices might be relatively the same on average, the volumes have increased, you know, widely, uh, you know, from 2019 to, to 2021 uh, through August. Um, and and I, I want to share just a, a few bits of information about the demand side. So historically, we've uh, looked very closely at the demand side of the market to uh, evaluate the, 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 you know, the ways in which companies are offsetting, how are they integrating offsets into the carbon management strategies. Um, you know, we're, we're very much focused on looking at the data that, that and let the data tell the story. Um, so in the in mid 2000, around 2015, 2016, we looked at voluntary buyers um, and analyzed their company's sustainability reports and disclosures um, and found that uh, it was that the companies were more often offsetting uh, if they were investing into emission reductions more than companies that were not offsetting. Uh, they were also uh, had, a, had a larger uh, understanding of their greenhouse gas emissions profile uh, through scope three emissions um, and then those that did not uh, offset. So what, what we found ultimately in, in very clear terms is that 
companies that were offsetting are actually further along on managing climate than the companies that are that were not offsetting. Um, and one other piece of uh, just to provide this down to the, the level of forestry and land use um, in our state of forest carbon finance report that we launched last year, we presented some data about 2019, which I'll show here on the screen. Uh, and, and what we saw here was that consumer goods, the finance and insurance sector and airlines accounted for about 60 percent of the purchased you know, volume of forestry and land use carbon credits. <clears throat> this this data is updated, so uh, but we we have unpublished data. So I, I'm presenting here just the the chart for 2019. Uh, but the unpublished data, uh, which we do have in a in a data dashboard. Um, so if anybody's interested in in seeing you know more recent data in 2019, please do let me know. Uh, but when we look at the, the the data from different years, we look we see that actually in 2018 and in 2021. The energy sector uh, dominated by far, you know, close to around 80%, if not more, of the purchasing and forestry and land use credits. So what this illuminates is that each year uh, we might see a difference in, in buyer activity, and that might be due to buyers you know, purchasing certain volumes in certain years. There might be um, you know, uh, pressures to purchase certain types. There might be interests that are evolving. Uh, this is a very fast moving market with a lot of variables that are, are, are influencing buyer decisions. Um, but, but what's also very interesting looking at the past few years from 20, in 2018 compared to 2021, that it was almost a, a doubling of price, if not a, a greater than a doubling of price that energy companies were willing to pay for those forestry and land use credits from just under $2 a ton to over $4 a ton. Uh, so, so this is moving the needle. Um, we, we need to be thinking about not just, uh, you know, the, the ways in which companies are dealing with climate uh, from, from addressing, you know, climate sustainability, setting goals, setting emission reduction targets and investing into emission reduction activity, emission reduction activities, but also how companies are, investing in uh, near-term solutions to allow us to not only address climate, but safeguard biodiversity, safeguard indigenous communities, safeguard other ecosystem values, such as water and, 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 and that are water infrastructure that might be, you know, sources as well as uh, feeds for, um, you know, for agriculture and other things. And, um, and so I, I think, um, I think I'll leave it here just to say that, uh, uh, what we are very optimistic about um, is that the uh, the size of this market seems to just be increasing uh, as we true up the 2021 calendar year data. Uh, it'll be very illuminating to see just how large this market got last year, uh, and particularly to show um, you know how much focus you know it really has been placed on different project categories. But we see. Just, just a large drumbeat uh, in the interest of forestry and land use credits because of, of the value that they offer beyond just solving climate, but dealing with you know, our landscapes and, and all the additional attributes, which I mentioned. Um, so there's still much room, much more to go in terms of uh, how governments will implement uh, the final Article 6 rules. Uh, there's still much more to go in terms of how companies will uh, will will develop their their net zero and climate strategies to integrate carbon credits, um, but but with all of this work left to be done, um, you know we can't we can't stop, and I think the world understands we can't stop uh, and wait for everything to be finalized in order to address these problems of climate uh, and and biodiversity loss and nature loss, uh, and that's why we see this uh, continued interest in in this space. Uh, so again, thank you very much uh, to the Asian Forest Cooperation Organization for having me. Uh, very much appreciate you taking the time to listen to my remarks. And um, again, please feel free to contact me if, uh, if you have any questions. Thank you so much and, and have a great rest of your session. That was Mr. Stephen um, Donofrio, Director of Ecosystem Marketplace. And next we have Mr. Chin Son Pir, Vice Executive Director of AFOCO, to present AFOCO Green Partnership and International Cooperation Platform. Mr. Jin was the head of Forest Aviation Headquarters at the KFS. He also has rich field experience in Indonesia and Mongolia. Based on his professional experience, he is contributing to further advance the multilateral projects of AFOCO in substance. And please welcome Mr. Jin with a warm hand.
Good day. I am Vice Executive Director of AFUKO. I am Jin Sonpil. I just realized I am the only on-site speaker. I actually was the one inviting the speakers, and I'm a little bit nervous to be the only on-site participant um, as one of, among the presenters. And um, we are uh, slightly behind schedule, so let me go quickly to my presentation. Uh, for climate action and ESG, are you interested in forest investment? Afoco is ready to partner with you, and that is the gist of my presentation. And as mentioned by the previous speaker, in November 2021, Glasgow hosted COP26. One of the key outcomes was the Glasgow Leaders' Declaration on Forest and Land Use to halt forest loss by 2030. And this was endorsed by 141 countries, accounting for more than 90% of the global forest coverage. Uh, this declaration is also directly related to the New York Declaration on Forests, or NYDF, adopted at the 2014 UN Climate Summit. And this um, declaration was endorsed by 39 central governments and 160 local governments, aboriginals, uh, local communities, corporations, and NGOs. The goal of the NYDF is to halve forest loss and uh, by 2020 and to end the forest loss by 2030. There are about 4 billion hectares of forests around the world at the moment. And in the past two decades, 10% of that area, or 400, per 400 million hectares, have been lost, which translates to 20 million hectares a year. Um, that is the size of the Korean Peninsula. The graph on the left shows forest loss before and after the NYDF. As you can see, even after the declaration came, forest loss was not reduced. In 2018, tropical tree cover loss led to GHG emissions of more than 4 billion tons, which is larger than the emissions from the EU across all sectors. The red and yellow areas on the map on the right indicate places where forest loss has led to higher GHG emissions since 2014. The UN developed in 2017 the 2030 Strategic Plan for Forests with six goals. Goal one is increasing the forest area by 3% by 2030, and goal four is mobilizing financial resources. The UN Forum on Forests, or UNFF, released its first report on the progress towards implementing the Strategic Plan 2030. And in this slide, I've only included the parts that relate to investment in forests. The pie chart shows that the global ODA dispersed on forestry amount to $800 billion, which is less than 1% of total ODA. But even this much actually marks a dramatic increase in funding on the back of climate-related funds since 2007. Another main pillar of forest finance comes from private sector investment. Citing the World Bank, World Bank data, the report estimates private sector investment in forests at about $15 billion. In addition, forest degradation led to loss of trillions of dollars in the value of ecosystem services. And globally, sustainable forest management requires an annual $70 to $160 billion. As long as return on investment is guaranteed, then a massive market worth 100 to 200 trillion won will be opened up. However, companies face challenges in deciding to invest in forests. And this slide highlights what was published in an international journal in 2019. Japanese companies were asked whether they intended to join the Red Plus initiative or forest carbon sink projects, and if so, uh, what challenges they face in being a part of such projects. The first challenge is that calculating carbon credits are very strict. Next, uh, partners are hard to find in host countries. Third, uh, the prospect of demand for carbon credits are uncertain. 
the project approval process is complicated in host countries, and there are technical challenges such as forest monitoring, and lastly, in selecting the right candidate sites, there are also challenges. So most Japanese companies prefer to support NGOs that take part in the Red Plus initiative and to purchase credits that are issued. I think Korean companies will be not much different. And let me now uh, move on to AFOCO. AFOCO, or Asian Forest Cooperation Organization, was officially launched as an intergovernmental organization in April 2018 for a joint response to forest issues in Asia. As you can see on the map, there are 13 member countries and three observers. In order to address current challenges of climate change and sustainable development, AFOCO launched the private sector engagement platform called the AFOCO Green Partnership. Instead of only pursuing government-led ODA projects, we wanted to diversify sources of funding with private sector investment and blended financing, as well as facilitate the connection of the needs of member countries with the demands of companies. The bottlenecks that hold back Japanese companies you saw on the previous slide could mostly be addressed in partnership with AFOCO. Even before being launched as a full-fledged organization, AFOCO started to build a network with host country governments and thus has established a great level of trust needed to promote these projects. AFOCO has translated capacity building on the field into actual change by running projects and training, edu training and education in parallel. Uh, the on-site working level officials from central and local governments were our partners and decision-making director generals consulted us on the way forward in finding candidate sites or understanding regulations and administrative processes for projects or post-managing project sites. We can therefore be your best cooperation partner. Also, to address more specialized areas, AFOCO has partnerships with domestic and global institutions that have the necessary expertise and the pool of experts in various fields. Companies can participate in AFOCO-led initiatives or engage AFOCO in corporate-led programs that we can agree on. AFOCO has six programs where companies can participate, and let me introduce them to you. The first program is SAVE, uh, which relates to biodiversity. As climate change, natural disasters, and other anthropogenic factors it's destroy the ecosystem and species, SAVE aims to preserve and restore them. Let me show you our projects as an example. On the left, um, this is Rosewood from Cambodia. And in Cambodia, timber theft and de deforestation has endangered rosewood species. So since 2016, the best individual rosewoods have been selected throughout the nation to obtain healthy seeds in a seed orchard. This project is ongoing. And another example is the Vietnamese mangrove forest, which faced one of the most severe ecosystem threats in the world. In Vietnam, war, typhoons, aqua farms, and firewood needs have reduced mangrove forests by half. Since 2015, a restoration project has been ongoing, focusing on the Thai Binh region, frequently hit by typhoons. Next is the LIFE program on developing forest-based local businesses. Mountains are home to a large number of those who live in poverty and use forests illegally, which is a main cause of deforestation. AFOCO is building a forest-based business model in host countries, um, exploring useful forest resources, commercializing them, and managing the forest together as a community, which will be key. Since 2016, the village-based forest rehabilitation project has been implemented in Laos, demonstrating that community livelihoods and forest conservation can go hand in hand. Starting this year, in all member countries, we plan to develop non-timber forest product projects in a customized and systematic manner for each country. Third, we have Climate Link, which is about carbon credit projects that you're interested in. To enable access to global climate funds, attract corporate investment, and contribute to achieving the NDCs of member countries, this program analyzes feasibility studies, develops small projects, and reinforces capacity of forest carbon sinks. 
As the table suggests, each nation is at a different level of preparation, which requires differentiated approach, and we will customize our program. The most notable program is the Red Plus Initiative. In rolling out projects, we will identify systems and administrative procedures of host countries, find reliable on-site partners, secure national data, including site surveys, and build a system that addresses risk. Fourth is Earth Garden, where the member countries create carbon-neutral national gardens or post-COVID healing centers. This program uh, primarily aims at upgrading existing arboretums, gardens, and parks, targeting places with large number of visitors. Projects will engage multiple actors and continue over the long run. To achieve net zero, Earth Garden pro Earth Garden projects will use renewable energy, recycled and upcycled materials, calculate the carbon footprint of visitors, and offset emissions by planting trees. In addition, botanic gardens of native plants and restoration facilities for climate vulnerable species will be established, and local residents will be provided with community gardens, eco education, eco tourism, and a place to rest. Cambodia, Thailand, the Philippines, Myanmar, and Indonesia have applied for this project. Next is Landmark 2.0, which is an upgraded version of our capacity building program. This slide shows our activities so far. We run a scholarship program, fellowship program, training courses, and a special one-month step or science and technology entry program. So far, we've established a regional education and training center in Myanmar for training courses. Under Landmark 2.0, we plan to operate regional thematic online and offline campuses. We also envision expanding the training to village businesses and forest-based social ventures and offering a vocational training program. We will um, create a sizable forest living lab, a study forest, to support continued research, including monitoring climate change impacts on the ecosystem. Lastly, the LPA, which is a program to restore dry lands. The institutions you see on the slide, including C4 ICRAF and the Global Evergreening Alliance, based in Australia and NGO, uh, have been working on this program for two years. And in the next 10 years, 10 million hectares of dry lands in Asia will be restored. At the World Forest Congress in Maine, Korea, this program will be officially launched. As with the AFR 100 initiative to restore 100 million hectares of forests in Africa by 2030, and the initiative 20 by 20 uh, to restore 50 million hectares in Latin America, this program will be country-led with diverse financing from the private sector and other sources. AFOCO is particularly focused on building forest restoration centers in each country that will be the center of nursing saplings in large scale, training and education, testing and research, and project monitoring. This is the AFOCO Green Partnership. To be sure, we will be doing more than what has been presented. If you're on the same page with us and our interests are aligned, we can together develop these programs and work on new items. I believe that this forum to provides us with opportunities to cooperate and engage in discussions, and I ask you for your continued interest and participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we will start the panel discussion, which is the second session of this forum. Let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Mr. Chong Yunbo, CEO of SK Forest. He, after serving in main positions at SK Energy and SK Innovation, Mr. Chong was appointed CEO of SK Forest. And next, we have Dr. Oh Do Kyo of KCGS. He led the ESG ratings team and is conducting research at the Policy Research Division with a focus on carbon neutrality, environmental management, SME, ESG, and ESG bonds, and green finance. And we have Mr. Yi Oksu, Director of Deloitte Danjin. 
who is the only certified accountant in Korea with more than a decade of experience in climate ESG and its sustainable development our areas. Mr. Lee received the Deputy Prime Minister citation in honor of his contribution to hosting the GCF Secretariat and advising the government on climate finance. He is truly an ESG leader. Next, we also have uh, Mr. Kim Jae-hyun, who served as the 31st Minister of KFS and is currently the professor of Kongguk University. He is a member of the Presidential Committee on Agriculture, Fisheries, and Rural Policy, and he also chairs the Board of Directors at Gyeonggi Environment and Energy Promotion Agency and the CEO of Peace Forest Work. Next, we have Mr. Park eun sik Director General of the International Affairs Bureau at the KFS. He received his PhD in Forest Resource from Seoul National University, and he was the Vice Executive Director of AFOCO and... After dating for his policy division and planning and finance division, he is truly an expert in international cooperation in forestry. We also have the presenters joining us. Last but not least, our moderator. He is the president of New Paradigm Institute, Mr. Moon Guk Hyun. As you all know, Mr. Moon was former CEO and chairman of the board of Yuhan Kimberly. He also founded the national campaign Keep Korea Green uh, 38 years ago and transformed Yuhan Kimberly as the most respected and admired company in Korea. And now I'd like to hand over the microphone to the moderator, Mr. Moon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank AFOCO, especially Executive Director Ricardo Calderon, for making today possible. And I would like to also take this opportunity to extend my gratitude uh, to His Excellency, former UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And also my special appreciation goes to the four presenters. More than anything else, uh, I would uh, like to welcome uh, key Korean businesses and institutions uh, leading ESG management and ESG investments here in Korea. Here we have altogether about 40 and uh, about 80 more joining us online. So welcome uh, to all the business leaders. And it's a great honor and pleasure of mine to have this panel discussion session with all these uh, business leaders. Uh, AFOCO was uh, founded four years ago, and in just four years, uh, here we are in this forum. And I believe that uh, green partnership uh, generated from AFOCO is now available for many businesses uh, to partake in. So again, I would like to uh, thank AFOCO and also Korean businesses for taking interest. And I ask our panel discussants uh, for your insights uh, during our panel discussion session. I'm sure you would all agree uh, to what Mr. Pan Ki-moon said earlier. Uh, and uh, with regard to the presentations that you heard, uh, you have five minutes uh, to share your uh, thoughts, your questions, and insights. So I'm going to give uh, each panelist uh, five minutes. And afterwards, I'm going to come back and give you four more minutes. Uh, at that uh, point in time, you can share with us uh, what your businesses are doing with, uh, with regard to ESG and also your um, insight and experiences. Of course, uh, he the first panel discussion I'd like to invite is Mr. Chong Yim Bo. Uh, he is with SK Forest, and I believe uh, that uh, he has made many efforts in the area of forestry. So I'm sure that you were able to find many friends uh, in the, this forum uh, that have the same idea and same vision. So please help me welcome Mr. Chong. So thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, for all the presentations. Uh, as I listened to the presentations, I was able to see that uh, the carbon uh, credits 
focusing on afforestation and reforestation. Uh, we talked about it a lot, and I believe that uh, the market is going to grow even further going down the road. And so uh, we have a lot of expectations. And at the same time, um, I also thought about what we can do in order to seize opportunities in this process. Starting from last year, um, if you look at SK Forestry, SK Forest, about 50 years ago, we started uh, planting trees. But uh, not stopping there, starting from last year, we started to look overseas and explore opportunities there. Uh, planting trees not in Korea, not just in Korea, but uh, in the, on private lands and also public lands. We decided to work with various partners and colleagues to do forestry management and uh, also generate um, economic values uh, from there. For example, carbon credits. By doing so, we believe uh, that we can generate more values out from the forestry. So we've been working on that uh, during the past several years. In doing so, I would say uh, there were some challenges and definitely uncertainties uh, with respect to our future. If I may elaborate, this may be limited to my personal view, but uh, because I'm in the industry of forestry, this uh, is strongly felt by myself. Now, if you look at other countries, especially Northern European countries, they uh, are engaging in the very active Red Plus activities and other forestry protection activities in order to secure uh, natural resources and also carbon credits. Not just that, uh, if you look at uh, Apple, Amazon, and other global companies, you've heard them uh, from the presentations, but uh, they also focus on uh, afforestation, reforestation um, in order to preserve forestry. In contrast, if you look at uh, Korea, MBS-based uh, carbon credits or carbon sink related uh, assessments uh, tend to focus on the carbon direct uh, reductions or CCS or other carbon absorption or sequestration technology. So compared to other DCCS and other technologies, I think that um, forestry or reforestri reforestation um, efforts are not uh, given due credit. So um, I did have some concerns uh, as to whether or not uh, our efforts uh, surrounding forestry will have future. If uh, we are to have a future, I think that MBS-based uh, carbon market has to be designed. If uh, we look at uh, Korea, MBS-based uh, carbon uh, market is viewed as such. However, if you look at other countries and uh, I think that Korean companies uh, would have to um, appreciate MBS because uh, it is scientifically proven and compared to other projects, it's uh, more high ad value added and it uh, has more economic benefits and values compared to other projects. So as uh, businesses seek to go net zero, I think that we have to find solutions uh, from MBS. If that is the case, if that is the basic premise, then I think that we have to have an MBS-based carbon market here in Korea. That market has to be prepared. And what I mean by that is well, CBAM of the, United, uh, of the European Union or carbon border tax of the United States, uh, they would have to recognize our carbon market. So if we can have a globally recognized MBS-based carbon market, then I think that more and more businesses uh, will try and join the, these initiatives uh, to trade carbon. So that's uh, something that I thought about during listening to the presentation. Thank you. Please turn on the microphone. So you believe that the carbon credit market will grow, but you do not see enough investment in the Korean carbon-related market, particularly securing carbon credits from MBS, should be further fostered. I think that was the gist of your um, remarks. 
I think that the former minister of KFS, Mr. Kim Jae-hyun, you can touch upon this point later on in your turn. And now I'd like to invite the next panel, Dr. Oh Dokyo. Please welcome Mr. Oh with a big hand. Uh, hello, I am Oh Dokyo from KCGS. Thank you for inviting me to this important panel. I think that in the case of Korea, carbon neutrality is a hot buzzword. Of course, ESG was a key topic. And I think now the key, hottest topic is um, carbon neutrality. Last year, the Korean government announced a new NDC to reduce GHG emissions by 40% from 2018 levels and to become carbon neutral by 2050. Not only companies, but all members of the Korean society needs to step up their efforts towards carbon neutrality. And I say this because um, carbon neutrality must include carbon sinks, which did not receive enough attention so far. But as we coined the term net zero, carbon sinks have started to receive more and growing attention. And as has been mentioned by Mr. Zhang, CCS technology is also very promising. And um, But to be realistic, I think the most um, feasible um, measure would be forest carbon sinks. In November last year, GIA announced the uh, net zero plan, which included carbon sinks, um, using wetlands for as carbon sinks. Um, as you know, the tidal land um, carbon sinks have not been recognized by UNFCCC yet. A professor at Seoul National University conducted a research, and based on the outcome, um, the plan is to be recognized by UNFCCC. Um, specific carbon sink, I think, was included as a plan for the first time by Kia. And starting this year, I think large companies will um, lead the way in announcing a series of master plans in the same vein. For forest, projects, I do see a paradigm shift. Uh, the Keep Korea Green project was really focused on CSR. Uh, and for uh, restoring and creating new forests. But today, as you heard in the presentation, CSV uh, shared value, creating shared value is more of a focus while pursuing shared value. Um, at the same time, companies pursue profit. Um, and as you heard during the presentation, uh, uh, based on results, um, uh, the promise will be rewarded. What is the upside of this? Uh, forest projects. This is a long-term project, but um, carbon sinks can continue to improve. So uh, when you plan for carbon sinks and net zero, you must have a very solid foundation to minimize uncertainties. So for businesses, that is why uh, forest projects can be very attractive, but of course the downside is a high initial investment that is required. But by using financing methods, you can reduce initial costs, and I believe that we will be seeing such new methods soon. When AFOCO uh, pursues carbon sinks and other forest projects, please present more ways for companies to be a part and ways to reduce uh, initial cost and to be maybe increase the investment along the way in the middle of the project based on results that are produced. 
I think that um, for forest projects, many people ask me whether they are ESG activities. Of course, they are, and they are very much focused on the E part, environment. Then how can we reflect the ESG indicators in this case? Well, the effects of forest projects should be the focus. There can be carbon sinks. There can be um, reduction of PMs um, by absorbing uh, pollutants, air pollutants, and also managing water resources. And finally, um, conserving the ecosystem and biodiversity. And so going forward, I think these will be very important. And um, in terms of assessment of ESG management, uh, we need some specifics. Uh, the social impact report, such as ISC, from ISC uh, is what is needed. But I think in terms of reporting, um, this project is, does not produce as much reports. Last year, the KCGS um, revised its standards, uh, reflecting the opinions from KFS to include forest projects such as Red Plus Initiative and to recommend um, participation in such initiatives. When assessing and evaluating ESG management, um, I'm not. I don't think that forest uh, projects are very much addressed in detail. But if net zero and carbon sink projects are more included, then I think that uh, forest projects will be more uh, closely observed. And lastly, I'd like to mention greenwashing in all sectors. Greenwashing has become an important topic, and as you heard from the presentation, in overseas initiatives, um, there are criteria that participating companies must meet. Uh, they need to set up um, reduction plans based on SBTI and present a sustainab sustainable development report and also include up to scope three to reduce GHG and also calculate GHG emissions. When companies that do not meet this um, requirement participate, then um, greenwashing, there is higher risk of greenwashing. From the consumer side, uh, there is a huge amount of interest and participation. But of course, that is non-manufacturing sector that do not emit much emission um, GHGs. But um, as for emissions reduction plan and reports, they should be a part of these projects so as to address the risk of greenwashing of participating companies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I think that Dr. O oh has very in-depth knowledge in this sector. And to achieve net zero, uh, forest projects can be a good method, and he also recognizes the high entry barrier, but you can use financial um, investment methods to reduce initial costs. Thank you for your remarks. And as for a third panel discussant, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lee uk -soo, director from the Korea. Please help me welcome him with a big hand. Yes, good afternoon. I'm with uh, Deloitte Korea, and I'm responsible for ESG and climate change at uh, the company. My name is Lee Uksu. It's a great honor and pleasure of mine to join this forum. Starting from 2010, um, I started uh, to handle many um, issues and tasks related to climate change, uh, which is quite unique as a public accountant, certified accountant. And starting from last year, I started to see a lot of upswing in the interest and I think that uh, with especially within uh, the climate change I think that uh, the role of forestry is gaining attention pension funds and also state uh, banks and also other commercial banks and uh, there are other businesses that I give my advice to and I tell them that uh, forestry is uh, is going to be more important going forward the reason is simple 
Uh, starting from 2050, many businesses are going to, they committed that they're going to realize net zero or carbon neutrality. But uh, as was just mentioned by Mr. Oh, there is uh, the risk of greenwashing. So uh, I think that in order to realize uh, in order to do a genuine offset, uh, not doing greenwashing, I think that the answer is uh, quite simple. First is CCUS. Uh, you have to uh, capture the carbon, use it, and store it. And then uh, second, uh, you have to offset it. And other than these two, I don't think there is any way we can remove uh, carbon uh, from the air. Because uh, if you reduce it from somewhere, there is going to be an increase in somewhere else. And uh, going forward, I think that inevitably, I think that uh, in order to realize net zero and carbon neutrality, I think that uh, reforestation and uh, afforestation is going to be very important for businesses. So I think that there is a basic understanding of the importance of forestry. However, for many private businesses to take part in forestry-related projects, there are some challenges that we need to address. So I would uh, like to share what they are so that it can provide some help uh, to many businesses here. So broadly speaking, for general businesses, we have manufacturing businesses and also financial companies. Uh, um, I think that there can be different incentives for them. Um, if you look at uh, Korean businesses, um, we have uh, ETS. Uh, businesses, and I think that the, the businesses that are taking part in ETS and those that are not uh, could have different tracks. Those who are joining ETS, uh, because uh, they are already regulated in terms uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the Korean government, uh, they have a target to meet when it comes to carbon reductions, and so out of the emissions that they emit, there would be direct emissions. Uh, and those uh, would have to be reduced. So, for example, power consumption, uh, it, in, on the other hand, is an indirect emission. So in order to uh, reduce indirect emissions, uh, we have RE100. So you can uh, use 100% renewable energy in order to reduce uh, emissions. And uh, there are direct uh, emission reductions. However, the solutions can be quite limited, although you have highly efficient uh, processes. Um, if you because uh, using some sort of fossil fuels is inevitable, uh, you can't really reduce uh, the direct emissions uh, to zero. And therefore, I think that uh, forestry-related projects uh, will be able to be very helpful. However, again, uh, depending on uh, whether businesses uh, take part in ETS or not, uh, the tracks uh, that they or the journey that they can take would be different. The outcome the results that the businesses achieve, if it's not uh, connected to ETS, uh, then I think that the incentive for the businesses will be quite limited. So how will we connect ETS uh, with uh, the forestry projects uh, is going to be something that we need to address. And I think that um, going forward, that is why Alphaco's uh, activities are going to be very important. Again, uh, here we there is a room for improvement. However, for businesses that is not involved in ETS, I think that there will be opportunities for them. Um, as we were able to see from the presentations earlier, there are some private businesses, for example, like commodities, consumer commodities uh, businesses. Although they don't emit uh, that much of a green, that much of greenhouse gases, but they still take part in these forestry projects is because. Uh, they are interested in green products, and they understand that consumers uh, require more green product projects. And that is why I think that more and more um, uh, consumer goods uh, manufacturers are taking part in the forestry product projects. So because they are not the main culprits of greenhouse gas emissions, um, they may not be included uh, in ETS. However, I think that um, attracting their attention uh, into the forestry projects uh, can be very helpful. On the other hand, uh, now I'd like to move on and uh, talk about financial institutions. I think that just like other ordinary businesses, financial businesses, financial institutions uh, also uh, have a lot to earn uh, from uh, the forestry project. And I think that there is a huge opportunity for them as well. Uh, similarly, 
what I said earlier was that uh, financial institutions are demanded uh, not to reduce uh, the emissions that they have emitted, but uh, as they extend loans to businesses, other businesses, there can be some emissions that these other businesses uh, are emitting. And therefore, uh, although it's not under the government regulation, it's uh, more like a voluntary emission reduction efforts. So I think that in the, that voluntary emission reduction efforts, uh, if the financial institutions utilize forestry uh, projects, and I think that uh, it will be quite useful. However, as uh, they undertake these activities, it's very important to have a firm system and structure in place. And based on that, uh, I think that we can propose different forestry projects to financial institutions and consumer goods companies. So uh, in proposing those initiatives, uh, the role of AFACO is going to be very important. Uh, private businesses or financial institutions, for them to take part in those forestry projects, I think that what they want is reliability. Uh, they want to know whether or not uh, reliable businesses and dependable businesses and organizations are involved in those projects. So if AFOCO can provide that uh, uh, certainty and uh, that confidence uh, to these uh, businesses and share those initiatives, and I think that uh, the, there will be more and more opportunities going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. So carbon emission reduction via forestry uh, is something that is relevant not just for forestry businesses but also for consumer goods companies and also even financial companies I think that there uh, are opportunities for them as well so that was the gist of his message and I think that uh, forestry is going to be uh, more and more important just like uh, CCUS and CCS I think that uh, reducing carbon emissions using forestry is uh, going to get a lot of attention. Thank you. And up next is former Minister of KFS and also leader of many different organizations and current professor, Mr. Kim Jae-hyun, please. Uh, good day. I would also like to join other panelists in thanking Afoko for inviting me to this important um, event. Um, I would like to start from a slightly different perspective. Korean civil societies on forests are joining hands with companies in their activities. And let me introduce what they are and what the progress has been. Of course, Mr. Moon, the moderator, and SK Forest have all have long experience, near 50 year experience in um, forest projects and creating forests. Yuhan Kimberly through Keep Korea Green campaign. Um, 38 years ago, uh, was another good example. But in 1998, when the Forest of Life uh, group was created, that was when Korean civil societies joined the efforts of creating forests. And let me introduce what the Forest of Life activities are and the uh, Peace for Forest. Uh, Peace Forest work my um, organization is doing and how we can continue to build solidarity. Uh, forest for Life started after the Asian financial crisis in 1998, and it aims at creating new jobs through forest projects. So it was actually a national grassroots campaign the government, companies, civil societies will work in partnership to take good care of our forests. And once this was set up, then the government led um, forest management projects. Forest for Life have been engaging in these activities since 2007. Um, we started to build a brand um, led by Johan Kimberly. There are forest management projects and the uh, Incheon Airport Authority. And we joined hands in Yongjong Island projects, which were very unique in their structure. Companies, local governments, public entities, residents and also civil societies joined hands 
uh, with a large amount of budget um, for a civil society movement for these projects. And we had a number of different ways to raise the funding. And of course, if you can see the slide, you will see that Johan Kimberly really led the way in forest management projects and in particularly to improve our daily life environments and strategically um, to raise interest among the citizens. We had school forest projects and social welfare facilities um, that were engaged in forest restoration projects. Starting in in the 2000s and particularly after 2007, a branded company started to take more active participation. The importance of forest management projects um, were sustained. Of course, forest management projects ha on, went on where in parallel with the improvement of daily life environment projects. Um, in the interest of time, I cannot um, give you a more detailed picture, but just very briefly, there is the Peace Forest work um, starting to restore forests in North Korea. In 1999, uh, this organization was set up. And as um, inter-Korean relations were severely affected by the politics, we could not maintain the project well. So in 2020, we wanted to focus more on a more global forest management projects and also a wider partnership. We are in discussions with our FOCO and many different um, corporate partners. So we are looking to shift our um, direction. And peace forest work, as you can see in the structure, as mentioned by Vice Executive Director Jin Sun Pira Wafoko, we are in discussions for a possible partnership based on the partnership. We want to gain public credibility uh, and we are looking at how to structure our relations with our FOCO and to be able to engage more companies and find candidate sites overseas. And this is where we are currently in terms of discussions with our FOCO. And to be more specific, we are still preparing for our projects. And we are looking at some of the borderline um, area projects. Of, again, Yuhan Kimberly, Purmoa, Unilever, and other companies are taking very active participation. And we are seeking um, in specific discussions with financial partners such as Shinhan Financial Holding or Korea Investment. Uh, and as has been pointed out, we have yet to systematize the structure and we need to work more on better preparing our projects. And we are going to look at how to complement this and to develop partner partnerships in more detail. Um, even within this area of civil society, we are really pondering on how better to do this. And this year, we have some plans that reflect a huge change. With Yuhan Kimberly in Yeoncheon, Gyeonggi area, for six years, we will design, monitor, and evaluate projects there. After setting up a solid system, um, we are going to give opportunities to companies to understand the values, environmental values of reducing emissions and also joining the local communities and creating social value. And also we will monitor and evaluate the economic value that can come from the project. So we are going to have a very specific test <clears throat> of the project. And because this is really a borderline area that's very close to North Korea, if inter-Korean relations improve, then we will be able to start restoring forests in North Korea as well. And we are making necessary technical preparations. And in Russia, Kraskino area, we are also envisioning another project. Northeast Asia, 
has a very huge crisis in terms of um, forest fires or um, diseases that are going around the ecosystem. So we want to work further with partners in Northeast Asia to restore uh, forest ecosystems in the region with corporate partners. That is the plan that we are currently implementing. And we can also build a technology system to restore 2.62 billion hectares of forests in North Korea and access those areas. Last but not least, um, and I apologize for taking up too much time, to expand the private sector investment in forests, uh, which was a request um, from the organizers. Um, we really need to, and we are at the middle in the middle of a paradigm shift from um, domestic centric projects to global projects. And as you heard earlier, we are securing more and more candidate sites overseas, and this can be a good platform for cooperation with overseas partners. But how to secure candidate sites in Korea is more complicated and requires more discussion. Um, we can think of forest banks or forest funds to find the solutions. Otherwise, we can also will be very difficult to um, secure carbon sinks in Korea. We do have a net zero plan, but in implementing the plan, we have about 220 to 30,000 different forests in Korea. So we need to really uh, detail and work on the plans. And I also want to look at private sector investment, public um, partnership, and social activities to all work in tandem. Uh, where private sector companies can participate, we need to reduce and minimize risks to facilitate their participation. This can be done by the government. Of course, through evaluation and reward system, we can do this. And civil society uh, and social economy, um, we are doing much work. And by creating social values, uh, we can together build up the overall ESG values. And by doing so, we can be more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was a lot of information. Um, but in the interest of time, we would like to move on to the next speaker. Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Park eun uh, Director General from the International Affairs Bureau of KFS. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank Afoko for giving me this um, wonderful opportunity. Now, I understand that this um, forum is for businesses, and I represent a government entity. And, uh, and I believe that uh, I'm here because um, I think that I can be a messenger urging businesses to take uh, more interest in uh, forestry and forest projects uh, on behalf of the Korean government. Earlier, we talked about uh, why more investment is required uh, in the forest. And on behalf of KFS, and I also welcome with open arms, uh, businesses taking part in forest-related projects. Recently, KFS signed uh, MOUs uh, with Korean businesses. And unlike uh, in the past, uh, many renowned uh, Korean businesses have come to um, sign an MOU with us. We have SK, POSCO, um, Yuhan Kimberly, and Hyundai Department Store. And uh, we also have other larger uh, businesses uh, who are um, currently in discussion to sign an MOU with us. Of course, we have ESG and uh, carbon emission reduction issues uh, emerging lately. And so many businesses are obviously interested in those topics. But it's not like uh, the businesses are only interested in forestry because of ESG affairs. For example, if you look at SK Forest and also Yuhan Kimberly, they've been traditionally interested uh, in forestry and forest projects. And also recently, if you look at um, forestry uh, recreation center and also um, other initiatives. Uh, you can see that there are many other ways of utilizing forest 
Forest definitely provides a lot of opportunities to businesses. Um, in the past, our forest was only utilized for CSR purposes, but uh, we have uh, now not just for carbon reduction, but biodiversity and uh, natural resources preservation uh, uh, are some other reasons why more and more businesses are taking uh, interest uh, in forestry. And I think that uh, Mr. Moon uh, also uh, was engaged uh, in various uh, forest-related initiatives while he was with Johan Kimberly. So KFS going forward is going to make efforts so that uh, the efforts that these Korean businesses are making with regard to their forest projects can be well appreciated. For example, we've included forest-related uh, initiatives into our KFS SG. And uh, we also have ESG model uh, standards uh, designed by KCGS now containing forest uh, projects. So I think that there is a standard and uh, structure in place uh, to give uh, assessments and also reward uh, businesses uh, with their forest projects. Lack of intelligence, lack of information, and lack of uh, methodologies and other uh, obstacles may prevent uh, businesses in taking part in those projects. But uh, we also uh, recently introduced uh, Red Plus uh, guidelines, and also we provide uh, separate training courses on Red Plus for businesses to develop interest. And we also at uh, KFS uh, develop different projects and uh, introduce it to Korean businesses. And we also have. Uh, together with SK Forest, uh, from the very beginning, started a project, Forest Project, uh, in Ethiopia. Currently, we have Red Plus uh, businesses and projects in four different countries. For example, in Cambodia, we have uh, secured a 65, uh, 650,000 uh, tons of uh, carbon credits. And uh, KFS, on behalf of the Korean government, also provided Korean businesses uh, to negotiate uh, with their government counterparts. So um, Korea was able to be entitled to 69% of that uh, carbon credits. So with regard to ITMO, there were re re negotiations are required and also international standards to abide by. So I think that KFS definitely can help businesses in those aspects. And also I visited Peru last month uh, together with the president of KFS. And uh, Peru is one of the countries where uh, Korea is collaborating closely for climate issues. and. Uh, Peru is interested in Red Plus initiatives of Korea. And so I think that uh, KFS can assist our Korean businesses to explore those overseas uh, forest project uh, opportunities. And uh, we definitely have some successful track records, and that uh, actually can lower the entry barrier for some of the Korean businesses. Finally, Throughout the world, if you look at uh, the trends uh, in the private sector, uh, I also attended the COP26 uh, summit uh, last year. And one of the key topics uh, was forestry. So earlier in one of the presentations, we were able to hear the declarations uh, that the leaders made uh, at uh, COP26 uh, to make zero uh, carbon degradation by 2030. And um, there is a new initiative that is launched. And uh, the goal is to raise 1 billion US dollars. And I've asked uh, personally, and in just uh, seven months, uh, they were able to raise all one billion US dollars uh, for that initiative. So I've asked, uh, did you expect this is going to happen? Um, and the chairperson told me that yes, eventually they thought they were going to realize their goal. However, they didn't expect it's going to be um, so fast. Amazon and other multinational companies are involved in those initiatives. And so I say that uh, Korean businesses also take part in those initiatives and have more interest in forest. Uh, by doing so, I think that you can address carbon uh, emission issues and also contribute to our nature and uh, to our climate. There will be many more opportunities before you if, do, if you uh, do so. And of course, the Korean government is going to do its part in order to assist the Korean businesses uh, in their forest projects. Thank you. So Dr. Park, uh, all together, uh, we were able to hear from five panel discussants. Um, I think that we are 10 minutes behind schedule, but uh, all together, we, um, although we extend uh, 10 more minutes, uh, we will have 25 more minutes left for us. And uh, our 
uh, speakers joining us from overseas. So we'll have to go pretty soon. So um, if you have any questions from the floor addressing our presenters from overseas, uh, please do share that. And I do have a question. So I believe it's a place like BlackRock, um, including Samsung Electronics and Korean corporations. Uh, innovative implementation of carbon and GHG reduction emission emissions reductions was required, according to a news report. Um, the mentioned companies, compared to their equivalents overseas, are emitting more carbon than are emitting more carbon. So why is that? And what is the government policy to make our Korean companies um, competitive in terms of carbon emissions reductions um, globally? So I'd like to put this question to maybe Ms. Margaret Kim or Mr. Zhang Charles Guichard or Stefan, since you need to leave us soon. so. Would you like to take this question, either of you? Perhaps the Korean government? Maybe I can ask Mr. Park instead to answer that question later. Or could you take the floor now? Um, sure. The I'm not in charge of the government policies of all that, but as the, far as I know, by 2030, uh, we have um, announced a uh, more ambitious NDC to reduce our emissions by 40% from 2018 levels, which is a more ambitious plan than the previous version. So different companies have been allocated their um, part. In the process of rapid economic growth, uh, we have a manufacturing-based economy, and that is partly the reason why we emit more carbon than other countries, and the government understands the seriousness of this and has established the Carbon Neutrality Commission to monitor and supervise um, reduction of emissions. And I understand the companies are under a lot of pressure to cut their emissions, and I met with the company representatives, and we have signed MOUs with them, and I learned that they are making much efforts. But of course, the efforts cannot bring about change overnight. And this remains a long-term task. And carbon emissions reduction should not be resolved or met through greenwashing. But more fundamentally, we need to have a good and healthy productive models. And I think that the companies are working towards this. And of course, in this um, in doing this, we can make use of the domestic forests as carbon sinks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Park gave us an answer. And as a member of the business community in Korea, I think that the more uh, smart factories are expanded, I think that 30% additional emissions cuts can come from manufacturing. But digital transformation or digital twins uh, enable this through the AI technology. But there is also the end-to-end -end throughout the value chain uh, digital transformation, which will build digital infrastructure and enable digital processes and digital leadership. And when that happens throughout the supply chain and value chain, additional 20 to 30 percent energy can be saved. And so we are um, optimistic. And digital transformation and smart factory equals ESG management. And I hope that we have another opportunity to discuss this topic further. Thank you very much. Now we have 20 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, before I evenly distribute that to our FAR panel discussant, I would like to ask a question. Now, based on my own experience, I think that uh, making investment uh, in forest uh, is a uh, a bit scary, can be a bit scary. Who's going to provide the candidate lands? 
And who's going to guarantee that the planted trees is going to survive? Who has that expertise? And uh, who is going to provide uh, the visible feedback uh, on a regular basis? So when uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, the campaign to make uh, Korea greener and greener uh, back in 1982 and 1983. I've uh, thought that uh, we have to um, set up a forestry co-op and work with them and also uh, work in partnerships uh, with uh, people working in the forestry industry. So back in 1984, with the government approval, uh, we made our very first donation, and we made that donation to KS, um, KFS and asked uh, the stakeholders there to keep uh, our trees alive. We promised them we are going to plant a lot of trees, but in order to uh, turn them into carbon sink, uh, we need much more expertise, and therefore we need the support of KFS. So KFS, KFS took that donation and worked uh, with uh, Forestry Co-op throughout the nation and planted trees and uh, raised the trees. So directly, we only planted about 5,000 trees, uh, but uh, billions more trees were planted uh, together with KFS and also co-ops. Afoco currently um, works in 15, 16 different countries. And I think that AFOCO can play that role of KFS in Korea. We can select for the businesses, uh, the candidate sites, and also do after service management for the businesses. So I'm very much appreciative of AFOCO. So why don't we give a big hand to all the hard work that AFOCO is making. Asia is a vast continent, and I think that providing that guarantee is not going to be easy. I've been working uh, for decades uh, with environmental organizations, and every time we make an investment overseas, uh, it's kind of scary because uh, you may not see the results or the outcome. But uh, together with environmental organizations, and uh, whether it's for CSR or CSV purposes, I think that providing that confidence and faith uh, for them so that they can make investment, it's very important. And I think that AFOCO uh, can do so. Um, we heard about AFOCO's uh, different, six different uh, programs, uh, Life, Save, and et cetera. Uh, Mr. Chin kindly shared with us uh, six different AFOCO programs that Korean businesses can uh, take part in. So you have the programs uh, before you. and. AFOCO is going to customize and tailor these programs so that it can be more befitting for individual businesses. AFOCO provides that consulting services. So again, I would like to urge 40 different businesses joining us, uh, each from online offline. Uh, this is going to be a huge uh, opportunity. So with regard to those uh, six different AFOCO programs, I would like to ask our five panel discussants, what was the most impressive uh, program? And uh, those of you in the floor, out of, that, uh, out of those six program, what was uh, the most impressive one? And uh, which one uh, did you think that you want to customize it uh, for your business? Now, if you're interested, become a member of AFOCO and uh, receive the consulting service from AFOCO. Now I'm going to turn to our five panel discussants. You each have two minutes. So with regard to Mr. Chin's presentation, Green Partnership, out of uh, five to six programs, uh, what did you find uh, as the most impressive program from your own point of view? And also, which one do you think that uh, needs further improvement? Um, can Professor Kim go first? Um, you all have been in the university, government, civil society, and you made great contributions to making that partnership possible. You are also the professor, you lead a civic group, and you worked for the government as well. So what is your experience in view? Um, AFOCO uh, 
presented a number of different programs for companies to be a part of. I think this was presented um, to help us better understand what AFOCO is doing. And in the end, I think that for the companies in terms of investment and to raise corporate value uh, to be a part of the project with AFOCO, I think companies need to take a more um, integrated approach rather than just picking out a single program. And when you go visit these um, forest sites, you will see that you really need to take a more comprehensive approach for the projects to succeed. There are sites and you need to zone the sites. In each different zones, you need to think of what kind of functions and services you want to develop. So that is about designing your project and also the governance side of what partners you want to work with. So if you can tackle these um, in a more comprehensive manner, you will be more synergetic in your projects. And when companies make their investments or take part, depending on their positions, they can adjust their um, approach and um, give changes or adjust their proportion of different um, parts of these projects. And I'd like to ask you all, in your respective sectors to build a consultative or implementation bodies to look at and build plans to specifically carry out these projects, we will be more successful. And for the government sector, there are a lot of improvements in terms of policies that we need. For example, the financial projects led by KFS has to change their standard. And when you want to use a domestic forest and contracts about using national forests um, sometimes make it difficult to be a part of such projects. So in step with the change of the times, um, we need to change as well. For example, to um, combine different national forests and to sort them out and build or plant trees to reduce emissions, you sometimes need to sell some of the slots in the national forests, and this has to re be returned to the state coffers, which is quite complicated and does not guarantee profitability. So if you look at the details of how these projects are implemented, there are hurdles along the way that need to be removed to better facilitate participation. And, uh, and when our focus secures um, candidate sites in partner countries and member countries, they are making efforts. And the level of investment that the member countries require is quite sizable. Um, even higher than what actually is put into the project. So when you choose these sites in member countries, I think you need a more uh, clearer criteria for companies to make the projects more efficiently and effectively um, by participating in the different projects. So. Rather than approaching these projects as a part of donation, which will be a, which will really limit the corporate participation, uh, they need to be more active. Thank you. And next, uh, Mr. Liu Su, Director of Deloitte, Anjin. Um, consumer goods companies and financial companies you thought said would find these projects attractive. Um, to reduce emissions through forest projects. So for consumer goods sectors and financial sectors, which out of the six programs you heard of is attractive? Is it Earth Green or is it um, talent development? Or do you want to look at ecosystems or mountains? So if you can choose two out of the six programs that will be most attractive to uh, for financial sector and consumer goods sectors. Yes, thank you for that question. Well, um, I think that all six programs are meaningful. 
So I think that it's really difficult to randomly select just two out of all these six. But while implementing these programs, I think that uh, I may be able to share a tip that uh, businesses can utilize. Now, broadly speaking, if you look at these six programs, I think that some focus on capacity building and some uh, focuses on actual investment attraction. Well, during my comment, uh, I talked about how forestry and forest uh, can uh, play an important role because the time has changed when it comes to greenhouse gas uh, Wanton greenhouse gas uh, equivalency is not just a symbolic uh, expression. Uh, now it's going to be directly um, reflected to the stock prices. Uh, in Korea, it's about uh, 30,000 won, and in Europe, it's about 80,000 won. So um, carbon uh, credits uh, are financial assets, and Although businesses in the past uh, focused it and approached it as a CSR, I think that nowadays uh, it's all about business. It can be part of their businesses. But in order to effectively utilize uh, these initiatives, I think that we have to approach businesses uh, using business language. So if I may share two tips. Um, the reason why I cited uh, consumer goods, uh, businesses, and financial businesses is because if you look at uh, businesses that emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, they, because of institutional uh, issues and, and uh, regulatory improvements are required, I think that, I think that it's uh, difficult uh, to purchase those credits and for the businesses in the compliance market. However, uh, for voluntary businesses, although they're not a part of compliance market, uh, financial institutions and consumer goods uh, that are interested in uh, forestry initiatives uh, can be brought on board and then uh, build some successful track records uh, together with AFACO and uh, prove that uh, they can be accredited by other um, overseas agencies and standard organizations. And then when the time comes, then uh, we can connect uh, to connect AFACO with uh, compliance market uh, businesses. I think that by then we can prove uh, to the businesses that uh, this is a well-recognized uh, method. And second, um, I think that for individual businesses uh, to take part in these initiatives can be a bit uh, difficult. But um, today, I think that various associations are interested. We have global alliances. And also in Korea, we have industrial sector associations. So perhaps we can contact uh, those associations representing certain industries uh, so that uh, those industries can serve as a bridge to bring on board many different businesses working in that industry. And together, they can also build a successful track record. And uh, that could lead to many more future projects for other similar businesses. Uh, that foundation, I think, is very important. So collaborating with different associations uh, is going to be important. I know that we have to start with so small. However, those small success cases uh, can lead to larger businesses having interest in these efforts. So based on my experience, I shared uh, two tips. Thank you. And moving on to Dr. O. Oh. You earlier said that forests can be a good way to reduce carbon emissions, but it may not be very an encouraging looking sector because of the high initial cost. What's your tip? And, um, reducing that cost. Uh, last year, uh, as I conducted research into forest management projects, I looked into different um, literature. The, what was pointed out commonly was a high initial cost. And I looked at why. And previously, many of these projects were handled directly. And that's why the initial cost was very high. And because um, companies didn't have experience in forest projects, uh, they went through trials and errors, and the uh, initial cost was high. But now things are different. 
Rather than companies directly um, leading these projects, they invest in projects for initiatives such as uh, FOCO to actually do the work running the projects with the partner countries. So I think this is similar to a monthly rent system. When you pay your rent, you pay your deposit plus your monthly rent, right? So when the deposit is high, your monthly rent is low. But when you pay a high rent, the deposit is low. So the initial, if you reduce initial payment, then more companies will be willing to participate. Of course, later, result-based payment could, in fact, push up the unit cost. But realistically, um, if we can bring down the initial payment um, to encourage participation of companies, that will help um, expand and widen the base. But how do what do we do with the cost? We need to conduct more research. Um, by last year, as I conducted my research, um, I came across this as a potential way to reduce initial costs. Thank you very much. Now we have two more panel discussants uh, who haven't had uh, the chance to share their idea yet. Uh, Mr. Chong Inbo. Forest investment is something that you've been working on for the past 50 years. Uh, you've uh, uh, definitely did made a lot of contributions, but uh, you did say that uh, there are still some uncertainties. But since uh, you heard about AFACO and uh, since uh, you heard about, um, since you all now understand that there is a COP of all uh, businesses on the same page, uh, now is your confidence level higher? Well, I think that going forward, we would require a lot of more support. And starting from last year, I did mention that uh, we made initiatives to make inroads uh, and to overseas, to make investments overseas. Um, I'm sure you would all know about uh, Red Plus projects. There are uh, less and less opportunities uh, where you um, can take part at the project level. Now, I think that uh, more and more projects are available in the jurisdictional level. So KFS or AFACO, an international organization. And without uh, the support of uh, a government agency or international organizations, I don't think that a private business can sit down and discuss uh, with a government counterpart so the deal can easily break down. So through today's forum, um, well, SK Forest uh, started talking with AFACO for uh, many months now. But going forward, I think that uh, there is a lot uh, of assistance that we can get from AFACO. And I think that realistically, there can be a lot of useful advice that we can get from AFACO. And I hope that this will continue. Thank you for your kind words. And last but not least, we go to Mr. Park eun And we will end with the final comment from Vice Executive Director Jin. Um, the KFS was not a very well-known government entity in Korea, but with the Force for Life projects, KFS is now uh, endeared by the Korean public, and it engaged in a number of different projects, such as creating the Tule Road. But in Asia, um, I think that we need a similar body uh, for the entire Asian region, for com communities to engage in common action against climate change and so forth. Um, AFOCO was established, as you just mentioned, for those um, reasons, for Asian nations to be shared the know-how and knowledge and experience of Korea. And as Korea um, moved on from uh, developing countries to an advanced nation, it has the responsibility to share uh, its experience. 
and I think our focus has been developing well so far. I would like to highlight that Korean companies are in a very good environment. For example, of course, the KFS and similar government bodies should, would exist in any other countries, but Afkoko is in Korea and is very active in Asia. So simply put, um, companies have different, a uh, very long list of menus to choose from. And um, as mentioned earlier, uh, Yuhan, Kimberly, or other companies had to pursue their projects directly. But now they can work through AFOCO or provide funding or also have the option of participating directly. So there are different layers to choose from to participate in forest projects. And so now we have a very lower uh, bar entry barrier for companies. And in relation to this, um, there are many different projects pursued by um, KFS and also uh, similar projects in our focus. So I ask the companies to take an interest. And um, the six programs that you heard about during the presentation are unique in their own way, and they you might find um, any of them to be aligned with your interests. And that could be a good uh, approach to take. My personal experience is that when you do a project in a certain country, um, for instance, there can be countries where there is not enough place for the residents to rest. This was in Myanmar, and if you can pursue an earth garden in Myanmar, every time residents go rest in those parks, they will be reminded of the fact that Korean companies actually sponsored um, the project to build that place, and that could really contribute in raising the level of living standards of these people and also contribute to achieving SDGs. And also, you will be able to ultimately um, get benefits in pursuing businesses in Myanmar. So there's a wide um, op choice for you and options available for you to choose the ones that best fit your com corporate situation to be most successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Jin, you talked about six different programs, and I think that that can be compared to um, artery. Now, there can be, uh, I trust that there are many other detailed uh, specific projects that other businesses can join. Um, yes, the six different programs, uh, I, would, I didn't present them for you to look at as different chunks. So if you're interested in carbon, you can't just simply ask for a site to do your project in. Um, member countries need to be able to trust you to provide their sites and land. So I'm just asking you to work, start working now um, in your projects. Uh, for example, if you want are interested in Earth Garden, if you want to put your name into a playground, for example, that is an option. And I said that um, developing the talents would be important and putting your name in a talent development project, even if you develop just five talents per year, would be a good example to raise awareness of your names in later on pursuing other carbon projects and doing your businesses there. So AFOCO has a number of different options available for you to use. And before my presentation, the third presentation was really about the importance of forests and 60% of all the carbon projects are focusing on forests. So you can see that there's a high level of interest in forest projects overseas. But there's a limited number of uh, and uh, finite size of forests in the world, and there will be certain sites that can be used for projects. So you can foresee a competition of projects to win the sites. And the ones sooner you move, the more uh, valuable your project can be. So don't. Um, in, don't raise your costs by being the latecomer. Most importantly, look for countries with the right governance in place. And that's 
the places that we are focusing on to prepare for projects. And please keep in touch and let us know as soon as possible for your benefit and for Com Korea and for Afoko. Let's do a win-win uh, game. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, from my experience, creating forests would, of course, reduce carbon emissions and raise and replenish water resources, reduce dust, and many other ecosystem services. But it's also a good opportunity to engage in dialogue with community residents. Um, over the past 38 years, Johan Kimberly has conducted the national campaign to keep Korea green. And there are projects like Earth Garden or building a school forest. We started with one school. Now we have seven, 8,000 schools participating. That means consumers want this for their own good and for their um, local communities. So engaging consumers, uh, we heard earlier, um, is about being recognized as an ESG leader among financial companies and uh, globally. Um, Johan Kimberly's campaign, Johan uh, Kimberly had to use about 15 or 20 percent of revenue for promoting the Keep Korea Green campaign, but later on that re was reduced to 5 percent. Where did the remaining 20 percent go? It went to employee welfare, it went to bottom line debt income. So when Yuhan Kimberly only had 1 to 2 percent of that income, it went up to 15 to 20 percent thanks to the process innovation, but also turning costs into resources. Instead of spending costs as AMP, uh, we forged an alliance with governments and civil society and local communities and turned our costs into uh, assets, building trust, and Yuan Kimberly was eventually um, able to uh, produce products that consumers wanted to use. The financial sector, consumer goods sector, uh, you may seem like you are unrelated to forests, but you really need to be the pro part of the project because of the consumer's unmet needs of um, goods that can help children have more forests and parks. And I think it goes same for um, Asians. So I think that our focal will be a success story for Asia. And I think now we have a good opportunity to share experience with the world. Um, 80 companies, financial institutions, thank you for being here, and experts, and also KFS and our focal. Thank you. And with that, uh, that is the end of the panel session. Thank you very much. Again, I'd like to thank the moderator and panelists. Please give another warm round of applause. And lastly, I'd like to invite back Mr. Ricardo Calderon, Executive Director of Upfoco, for closing remarks. Um, please welcome Mr. Calderon. Uh, good afternoon again. In behalf of the, on behalf of the Secretariat, uh, the 13 member parties and three observers, to our guests uh, from the private sector, the diplomatic community, those attending online, uh, and of course on site, and you stayed with us, to our very good moderator, our uh, uh, resource persons, and very important and insightful comments from our panelists. Thank you very much, everyone, for making this event a very successful one. Let's give a big hand of applause to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We have now reached the end of our full call corporate forum on forest, climate, and ESG hosted by AFOCO. I'd like to thank all participants for joining us. Our focal will continue to develop and grow to deliver on our mission, and I ask you for your continued support and interest. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>